Hi everybody, my name is Jamie Ruthenberg and you're watching another episode of Jamie's Book and a Bite. So today we're actually going to change it up a little bit and talk about a book named The Tale of the Beautiful Cat, written by Ruth Kane and illustrated by yours truly. And then we're going to move into the kitchen and we're going to make a classic comforting macaroni and cheese. It's my personal go-to and I'll explain why. And remember, always check out the bloopers at the end of the video, they're always pretty fun. So like I said, today we're going to talk about The Tale of the Beautiful Cat. It's written by Ruth Kane, the late Ruth Kane. Um, she passed in 2011 and the story behind this is very special. Ruth Kane was a trailblazer for women in her time in terms of blending family and career. And she did this during a time where it wasn't often that this happened. There weren't a lot of doors open for women um, in the workplace, especially in some of the work she was doing. She was a journalist, she was a reporter, she was a newspaper columnist, and later she was was also a public relations executive. So she was a big proponent in opening doors for women and supporting women in the workforce. She also was a great supporter of literacy. She actually donated much of her time throughout her life volunteering to help children learn to read in the Detroit public schools. So she's a very special woman and how this book came about is also very special. Her daughter, Carol Kane, contacted me. Carol Kane is an Emmy Award winning senior producer and host of the show Michigan Matters. And it's a show that's on CBS Detroit here every Sunday morning. And she had heard about me. Ruth, her mother, had written a story before she passed called The Tale of the Beautiful Cat and kind of wrote it out on paper. In 2017, Carol was actually looking to published the book. And one day I actually got an email from Carol and she had heard about me through some of the other work I've done and she wanted to talk to me about my illustrative work and how I possibly could be the illustrator of her mother's book. So after we spoke one afternoon on the phone it was clear to her that I was the right person to bring the whole story to life. So one night I sat in my bed, I had all the information she gave me on her mother and the story and I sat there after a very long busy day and looked at the information and realized what an honor this is. And it's, it was almost as if I could feel her presence when I was looking at this. And I knew at that moment I was the right person for the job. And it was, it's an honor to be the person that was chosen to bring that story to life. What was really fantastic is the book was released at the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy's Reading and Rhythm on the Riverfront right in downtown Detroit in August of 2017. And the book was read to all the children who came to the event from around the area. And Carol was there and her sister Nancy and it was, it was a special day. If you want to order the book, you can go to Amazon.com. All the proceeds go to the Detroit Public Schools Foundation. And the story is about a cat named Florette who thinks she's very beautiful, and she is very beautiful, to be honest with you. But she goes through an unfortunate accident where she loses a portion of her tail. And because of this, she feels that somehow she's lost her beauty. And in the end, the story is really about the fact that beauty is truly about who we are and how we treat others. And the importance of a loving family, and not only receiving love, but more importantly, giving love back. So the funny thing is, I personally own two cats. At the time that I did this book, The Tale of a Beautiful Cat, I did not own cats. I've never owned a cat in my life, to be honest with you. It was a rescue situation where the cats lived in another home and they got a dog, beautiful dog, but the fact is there was no peace for their two cats anymore. <laughs> Wasn't working out. So I took the two cats in. So when I created the visual of Florette, I created her to be what I think is a beautiful cat. Now I got Oz about six months later and he looks almost identical to Florette. It was almost like a foreshadowing of what was to come, which was Oz. So you're probably thinking, how in the world are you linking macaroni and cheese to this tale of a beautiful cat? Doesn't seem to make sense. You have to know Oz. He is obsessed with a few things. One, he's obsessed with pipe cleaners. I don't understand it. One day I had teaching supplies out and he, he loves them and plays with them all day long. He also loves hair bands. To put my hair up today, I had to go find a hair band which he hides them under throw rugs and I had to find one of these under a throw rug today. <laughs> Thirdly, he loves cheese 
any kind of cheese. And I know that cheese isn't necessarily good for a cat, so I limit or give him just tiny bits, but he obsesses over cheese. If he hears a cheese wrapper, or if you have a cheese stick and you're opening it up, he is right there staring you down the whole time and he really wants some of that cheese. So, in celebration of my beautiful cat, Oz, I thought we'd make the quintessential comfort food, macaroni and cheese. One of my favorites. Let's go do it. Okay, so we're in the kitchen, and this is a very basic, kid-friendly recipe for macaroni and cheese. You can add anything you want to it. You can add bacon, you can add ham, you can add onion. I'm gonna make this a very, very mild mac and cheese too because a lot of times kids don't really want the onions or the garlic. But as you're melting the butter, you can saute onions and garlic in there in the beginning. A lot of times people add dried mustard or hot sauce, or vegetables, any kind of veggies you want would be great. But again, like I said, this is just your basic macaroni and cheese. Perfectly delicious and equally delicious, but just your base. So first what you need to do is you need to boil your pasta to package directions. Now normally people use, I can't open this, this is great. It's like Fort Knox. A lot of times I use penne or I've used egg noodles too. Egg noodles are wonderful because they're rich. Today we're going to use chalantani, which are these little fun swirlies. I find them to make the mac and cheese feel a little more gourmet. And I really like the texture of the pasta as well. And when you do second day, when you're doing leftovers the next day and you reheat it, what I love about this pasta in particular is it really, it's strong and it holds its shape well. It doesn't melt away on you. So this recipe calls for two cups. Basically a half a pound, so half of this box. I oftentimes will double this recipe depending on how many people are eating, but today I'll just do a single since it's only me today. So it'll be a, at least a couple couple meals out of it. You're supposed to get two to four servings out of this depending on how much your family eats. <laughs> My family, you're gonna get about two tops. So half the package goes in here. Okay, we'll bring this to a boil. Always salt your water when you're cooking your pasta, but don't salt the water until the water comes to a boil. It takes a lot longer if you add it in the beginning for the water to boil. So, good tip. But your water should always taste like the sea because you're flavoring the pasta as well. So we'll give this a quick stir. Oops. <laughs> Bring it back to a boil and cook that. Meanwhile, we work on our cheese sauce. I have three tablespoons of butter that I melted and I'm going to add three tablespoons of flour and then stir that all together. So you cook this, you let this get really nice and bubbly and you cook it for at least a good minute to cook out that raw flour flavor and to give the butter a nice nutty kind of flavor as well. So we're about there. Now remember if you want to add onions or garlic to the recipe or both, which I like too, you can add it here and like saute them until they're translucent and then you add the flour. For this, I'm leaving it out. I love onions but lately they don't love me. <laughs> so I'm going to leave it out. And plus a lot of times if you have children, sometimes they're a little finicky about it. So next, we are going to add in three cups of whole milk. Stirring quickly in. Woo! So we have the milk in, and you stir this constantly until the milk comes to a boil, a bubbly boil. At that point is when you add all the cheeses, but we have a second. I have to wait for this to boil. <laughs> uh, I get slap happy in the kitchen. Okay, so we are boiling. We are really cooking with gas right now. <laughs> I can't even see you. But at this point, I just, I let it bubble for just maybe 30 seconds, a minute or so. Again, to make sure that raw flavor of the flour is cooked out. And at this point, I lower the heat and I add in the cheeses. Now, I have three different cheeses in this sauce. So, controversial cheese alert. <laughs> One of the cheeses in it is the good old cube processed cheese. Now, I know that processed cheese is frowned upon in the culinary arts, 
but it makes for very creamy sauces. The consistency is wonderful. So, and it, it's great for dips too. So we are going to put in eight ounces of processed cheese, and we're gonna stir that around just so that it melts. And then, and just make sure that you have the heat on low. I grated myself an eight ounce block of medium or sharp cheddar. I like medium a bit. You can add in sharp if you want to, but I will tell you, you really should shred your own cheese. When you buy those bags of pre-shredded cheese, they put stabilizers in them and they're just not as creamy and they don't melt as nicely. Actually, a little tip too. That's the same thing for chocolate chips when it comes to chocolate. My two loves in life, cheese and chocolate. <laughs> I love chocolate. But chocolate chips also have stabilizers in them that stop them from melting. So if you really want a nice melty chocolate, you can chop it yourself from blocks of chocolate. So anyway, just a little side note, a little helpful baking tip. <laughs> so I've got this pretty much melted. Next, we're gonna put in the eight ounce block of cheese that I have pre-shredded right here. So let's add that. I also like to add parm. Parmesan cheese is wonderful. It adds this nuttiness and this saltiness that's really nice. I mean, it doesn't have to be an Italian dish, like this is an American mac and cheese, but I'll tell you, it's a wonderful addition. If your kids don't like it or if you don't care for it, you can take it out. But again, I love it. So I put a cup in, you could add a half a cup if you'd like. And also, as same with the cheddar, I grated my own Parmesan. I got a nice block of Parmesan and I grated it up. So this is beautiful. So I'm gonna melt this. So this is melting together and the pasta is actually done. So what I'm gonna do, this is a little trick, instead of draining my pasta, I actually have one of these nice slotted spoons and I just add it directly to the sauce. Okay, let's add in the pasta. What's nice about this technique of taking it right from the water to the other pot is that you have this wonderful pasta water here and when you're doing certain sauces sometimes you need a little liquid to loosen it and this nice salty pasta water starchy pasta water is wonderful for that okay i got all the pasta into the nice big pot i'm going to move this out of the way now another fun tip at this point a lot of times what people do is they will put it in a nice baking pan and they'll put crumbs on top and they'll bake it. I'm going to do something that also might be a little controversial. I'm not gonna put it in the oven. I have found this wonderful shortcut and that's why I call it a shortcut version in the title down below. The thing that I tend to have a problem with with baked mac and cheese is not, I mean, there really is no such thing as a bad mac and cheese, right? I mean, it's like pizza. Even when it's cold, it's good. But in ter there's just certain things that make it exceptional. And the one thing that always is a bummer to me is when the mac and cheese comes out of the oven and, it, you know, it gets dry. The pasta absorbs the liquid and it can be a dry macaroni and cheese. So I'm going to actually cook this over the stovetop for a good five to 10 minutes, get it to a bubble, and then put it on kind of low and let it simmer and bubble so you get a thick consistency that you want for your mac and cheese. And then you're gonna let it stand for about another 10 minutes off the burner before you eat it to let it set. But there's three reasons why I do this. One, it keeps it creamy. Unlike some of the baked macaroni and cheeses that come out and they're just kind of dry and lumpy. Number two is just like number one, <laughs> keeps it moist and creamy. The liquid retains itself in it. And another reason I do this is because when you have a bunch of little hungry tummies waiting for dinner, they will have this, From the, at this point, they'll have it in another 10 to 15 minutes. If you were to put this in the oven, you're gonna wait probably another 45 minutes or so, how, depending on how big your pan is. So you can feed your family quickly. This is a great weeknight meal because it's just on the stove, boom, done. I'm gonna let this cook for probably another five minutes or so, going by how it looks. And then we're gonna move on from there. And then I'll show you what it looks like. You wanna keep stirring this and put it on kind of low because the cheeses will burn if you put it on too high and if you're not stirring it. So I'll see you in a minute. <laughs> okay, hi again. So we are there. At this point, I want to actually taste it to make sure there's the right salt and pepper. 
I'm going to turn this off. This will burn your face off, so <laughs> cool this off a sec. Mm -hmm. When you weren't looking, I actually added a little salt, so I think I did a good job on that. Could use a little pepper. Stir that in. So, all right, I'm going to take this off the burner, set it somewhere cooler on the stove top, and let it rest. And I will see you in a minute. Well, here it is. The epitome of comfort food. I actually put a dollop of sour cream on the top and then I put a little fresh cracked pepper. Some people might say that putting sour cream on mac and cheese is a little decadent, but I don't know what that really means. <laughs> like I said before, you can put anything you want. You can tailor this to be anything you want it to be. If you want to put bacon, ham, any other kinds of meats that you like. Vegetables are great in this. Broccoli, cauliflower, peas, hot sauce, dried mustard. The sky's the limit on this. And you can change up the cheeses. You could make this an Italian mac and cheese and put fontina in it and other you know Italian cheeses. It can be anything you want it to be. And what's really cool is as your children's tastes grow, so can the mac and cheese. You can add to this what they like and it can kind of grow with them. Well, so here's the moment of truth. I know I tasted it a little bit earlier, but I'm going to take a, a real bite. Mmm. <laughs> it's so good. It's so creamy. Don't be afraid of the processed cheese. It makes the consistency of it and it's so creamy. And wonderful. And I'll tell you what, that parm gives it that nutty bite and that depth. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful addition to this. So the recipe is below. Please remember to hit that subscribe button as well. So remember, if you want to buy The Tale of the Beautiful Cat, it's on Amazon.com and all the proceeds go to the Detroit Public Schools Foundation, which is really wonderful. Well, thank you for hanging with me. And until next time, and remember... <laughs> In this case, there's three reasons why I do this. Let me remember what they were. <laughs> Great, Jamie. This is nice, nice. This is nice. This is nice. I have to wait for this to boil. <laughs> and please hit that subscribe. Subscribe. -boo. So the recipe is below. <laughs> Get serious. <laughs> I really could. I could totally entertain myself all day long. <laughs>